you might get the impression, looking at numerous media, that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs is in fact the head of the military. Yeah, and it's totally false. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs is not the head of the military. He is the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which are a uniform division of military officers that sit within the Pentagon in the Department of Defense. But again, the head of the Department of Defense and the United States military is the Secretary of Defense and the Commander-in-Chief above them, and that's it. There is no legislation or law that inserts the chairman, any chairman, this one or otherwise, into the National Command Authority. Some people might say, well, these are unusual circumstances or something like this, right? Well, they might, but that's the whole point of the law. It's that it's to be followed in usual and unusual times. And for the media, or many in the media, to interject uh, salacious headlines that trigger false narratives to be created, such as this one, that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has operational authority or has the ability to influence the president's political appointees is reckless and contradicts our constitution and the laws that were set up to run the Department of Defense. So, so how does the chain of command actually work? Okay, that's a great question. I don't think people have focused on it at all. The chain of command for purposes of the national security matters goes from the president of the United States to the secretary of defense and then the secretary of defense issues orders throughout the world based on his combatant command, what are called combatant commanders. Those are four-star generals in charge of different regions of the world. And then the chain of command continues below them. So, for instance, say the president decides to do a hostage rescue operation. What happens is the president, and only the president, can determine whether or not to implement the United States military to go to country X or location Y. Once that decision is made, the Secretary of Defense then takes over under the National Command Authority and based on where the raid or rescue operation is supposed to work, or supposed to occur, excuse me, then the individuals under that chain of command continue the operational execution of what the president said. And the chairman's role in all this of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is to advise the president on whether or not doing that hostage rescue operation is safe. Is it going to endanger lives on the ground? Is it going to endanger US military? Or is it gonna cause a reaction of a foreign government that would violate uh, American interests or American national security interests? So that's how the chain of command works. I'll give you an example of something that I was involved with specifically, and that was the Baghdadi raid. So at the time, I was uh, running counterterrorism at the White House under President Trump, and so obviously we were very involved with um, the hunt for, the, at the time, the world's biggest terrorist. What happens is, once you get to a certain point where you think you know where that individual is, you take it to the president to say, are we going to utilize the United States military to conduct a raid and try to kill al-Baghdadi? So on major decisions of national security, the president obviously has a number of advisors that go to him, his, specifically his national security advisor, the secretary of defense, individuals that are running places like the CIA and the NSA, and of course, his senior military advisor, which is the chairman of the joint staff by statute. So on a day like we're going to do Baghdadi, what happens is there's a lot of work by a ton of individuals that precede the time you take the material to the president. Then this group of individuals gets together at the White House, like we did, I was there on that day, and they brief the president on the latest intelligence, the upside, the downside, the positives, the negatives, what could go wrong, how they see it going. And then after the president digests all that information, including what the chairman of the Joint Chaffs has to say, then the president makes a decision on whether you go or you don't go. And on this day, as we all now know, the president ex uh, ordered the raid on al-Baghdadi. So for an event like the, the al-Baghdadi raid, what happens is the president convenes an NSC, a National Security Council meeting, where he himself, the president, on this rare occasion, convenes with his secretary of defense, his national security advisor, the chairman, other heads of intelligence agencies, and senior folks at the White House to make a determination um, at the White House whether or not this is something that they want to engage in. And once on this occasion, because of the level of importance going after al-Baghdadi, 
It was one in which the president convened and kept his National Security Council in place at the White House through the entire raid while watching it. And because in a situation like this that, could is, that is so dangerous, the president is the only one who is able to either call it off because of a safety issue that comes up, or should there be a safety issue that comes up, he's the only one that can override um, anything that is being advised to him in terms of do we go or not. He's the commander in chief. So that's the perfect outline of how the national command authority goes from the president to the secretary of defense to the commanders on the ground overseas. And in this case, it was obviously in Syria. So that is how the chain of command works. Nowhere in that chain of command, be it the Baghdadi raid or otherwise, does the law give the authority to the chairman to issue executive action. And so in these advisors, I guess they fit in at different points in mm -hmm. this chain, or is it all in one, one place, just directly to the president? Right. It, it, in, in circumstances like this specific one, everybody's sort of in one place because the matter is such high-level national security interest that the president saw fit to convene his National Security Council and lead it himself. And that is step one of the process. Step two is the execution of the National Command Authority, which is what the law calls it, from the president to the secretary of defense to the ground-level commanders who are running operations. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff does not run ground-level operations. Congress removed that authority from him uh, in the 1950s. They have no executive command authority whatsoever. Well, and that's also interesting because um, it's been sort of suggested that, that uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs might have uh, some sort of even control over the nuclear codes or nuclear launch or something like that. I think it does the American public a great disservice when you have members of Congress improperly characterizing the roles of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff vis-a-vis -vis the nuclear arsenal. When you have elected officials who are in the House of Representatives and the United States Senate and they are, they are talking to the American people through the media and stating that the chairman has operational control there, they are telling the American public a total falsehood. He does not have that authority. He never has. And unless the Congress changes the statute entirely, he never will. So I think too many Americans now have been misinformed and unfortunately by a large media that is allowing such bad information to be publicized that it's hard to correct the record. 